everybody, Carrie Hanel with the Education Trust West. We are an advocacy organization committed to closing opportunity and achievement gaps, but we're also a research organization. And we take um, the research and the data very seriously in thinking about how we um, inform policy and shape um, our positions. So over the last four years, we've been looking at the implementation of the local control funding formula. And recently, I think in April, we put out our most recent report, which looked at the, the question of resource equity. So we've looked at things related to implementation, we've looked at community engagement and the LCAP, but now that we're several years in and, and potentially have some available data, we did want to look and see how the money is actually flowing. So the big question we had, and I think the same one that drove initially the Cal Matters article, is where is the money going? Um, I would actually suggest that maybe the reason the Cal Matters article pivoted to focusing on the achievement gap is because it couldn't answer the question it started with which is where's the money going and how is it spent, which in some ways is a first order question. We have to know where the dollars are flowing because dollars translate into people and services, and we know that people and services are the very things that help us close achievement gaps. Um, so I think it's an important thing to keep in mind because if we can't answer that question, many people are gonna leap ahead and look for that data that we already acknowledge is quite lagging, and that might be misleading at this stage of the game. So, what we can look at, though, is <clears throat> how the money is flowing to school districts. And this is, you know, this was a structural point in LCFF. What we tried to do is send more money to high poverty school districts. And so you would expect that higher poverty school districts are indeed receiving more money. Um, and the good thing is that the data do confirm that. So what we find is that over time, we have shifted toward greater equity in how the state is allocating revenues to school districts. Um, a couple of points I want to make here. One is that we actually have accomplished this in the past. So if you look at 2007-08, which was the peak of the economy, at least in recent years, we actually were funding districts equitably already. And then when the recession hit, the highest poverty districts felt the brunt of that. And then as we flowed money back into school districts as the economy improved and we had LCFF, higher poverty districts are now getting more. Um, but the, the, I think the lesson to be learned here is that we are about to enter another recession. And I think it's going to be important to continue to look at this trend line to see if LCFF is as stable um, at, as we need it to be for those higher poverty school districts, or if once again we're gonna see the greatest cuts and reductions um, in, the, in the schools where the kids have the greatest needs. Another point I'll make here is that this is school districts overall, but we see big differences by type of school district. So unified districts have maintained the most equity over time, um, but we're still seeing inequities in our high school districts, and elementary districts are somewhere in between. So there might be reason to look at how those dollars are flowing within district type. I'm not gonna go through all this data, but one of the things I do wanna point out is that there are, that virtually every district, not every district, but virtually every district has received increases under LCFF, and most have re received quite substantial increases. And I don't, think we should just pass this off. It's really important to remember that the total per pupil dollar amount has gone up quite a bit, particularly in our highest poverty school districts. So for example, if you look at Santa Ana Unified, since the, the previous peak, 2007, 2008, they've gone up 42%. And if we look at since the recession, they've gone up nearly 60% in per pupil revenue. So this is, a bit, I think, something that we should celebrate. We really are directing more money to our schools, especially that higher poverty. Um, school districts. Okay, so, so this is where we, sh we really wanted to be able to say, well, what about within school district? That's the big question. So districts get their money. Are they then making choices about what they do with that money such that it goes disproportionately to schools serving more low-income students, more students of color, more foster youth, and so on? And we can't answer that question. And that, I mean, this is a data problem, right? But what we can do is look at some proxies. So we looked at a whole bunch of staffing data that the state makes available. And I will say that the state actually makes very good data available on staffing that we were able to mine. And we found that um, per pupil ratios have improved across the board. Um, class sizes are smaller, not as small as they were in 0708. We have better access to counselors, not as good as 0708. Um, but in general, things are still pretty bad um, compared to national benchmarks. So for instance, we have one nurse per 2,700 students 
We have one counselor per 800 students, which is nearly double the national average. One social worker per nearly 13,000 students. So these are big issues that LCFF has not addressed. They're probably issues of adequacy that we need to continue to talk about. When we look at the types of schools that have access to these personnel, we still see inequities. These inequities have persisted over time, but one of the things I want to point out is that when you look at something like counselors, the lowest poverty schools, so the, the, the schools that have the fewest kids who qualify for free or reduced price meals, actually were kind of able to maintain access to counselors even during the recession. Where we saw the dip were in the poorer schools. And this is a trend that we see across lots of different kinds of positions. We see a lot of restoration happening, but we still see achievement gaps. I'm, I'm sorry, access gaps. The other thing that we could look at as a proxy for where the money is going is to coursework. So one thing that districts could choose to do with their dollars is to expand access to rigor. They could also choose to expand access to a broad course of study. So as some, some proxies, we looked at calculus, physics, music, and computer science. Once again, across the board, we see inequitable access where if you attend a wealthier school, you're more likely to have access to rigor, you're more likely to have access to computer science, you're more likely to have access to music. Um, and we see some interesting trends happening um, as LCFF comes in. So if you look at music, for example, um, in 14-15, suddenly access to music in our wealthiest schools goes way up, which I, I don't have data to explain, but it does raise questions about what kind of community engagement, stakeholder engagement, and advocacy is happening in those communities. Um, the good news here is that across the board, we're improving access to calculus and physics. So there are some good things happening, and then there are also some questions and concerns that emerge from the data we looked at. So the question that we always get when we present this data is, well, where's the money going? You know, so we, you see a little bit here, a little bit there, but what's really happening and why aren't districts doing more? So we've acknowledged already the, the very real budgetary constraints that districts face. We are indeed seeing huge increases in pension obligations at the same time that LCFF is, is hitting. And those pension obligations are going up fast at the same time that LCFF is flattening. That's a, a, a huge problem for many school districts, particularly those with declining enrollment. And it's very real that we're seeing in, increases in costs related to healthcare, even things like energy. And then the other thing that we're hearing is that when, in the first couple of years of LCFF, we thought about the increased services piece of increase or improve services. There was this assumption that with an incremental dollar, we were supposed to do something new, add a new tutoring program, after school program, section of algebra, whatever it might be. And the problem with where we are now is there's not a lot of new money. There's not a lot of incremental money. And so what we're seeing is not a lot of new services. And what we're hearing is that there hasn't been a big shift toward talking about improved services. And so as we think about what the bottom bullet there, limited innovation, we're seeing that there needs to be a shift in the way we think about how we allocate personnel, how we allocate resources so that we're doing more with the same. For instance, converting a section of English to A to G English. It doesn't cost any more but provides a, a different kind of service. And then finally, the, the bullet in the middle, we are, um, there's a reality that while we've changed the funding structure, changed the expectations on our school districts and emphasize continuous improvement, we haven't re addressed many of the policy barriers and constraints that exist both in our education code as well as in our contracts. So for example, we heard yesterday of a district where parents are, are, who have been involved in LCFF are very upset because their schools are the ones where teachers are receiving pink slips because they're newer teachers, right? So the, the higher poverty schools have a revolving door of teachers, therefore greater teacher instability, therefore greater workforce issues and climate issues in those schools, the very schools that they expected LCFF was, was going to stabilize. So clearly there are policy issues for that. There, you know, there are rifts in law that we, that we have a hard time getting around, but until we address those things, the promise of LCFF, particularly for parents and students in those high poverty communities, is going to be empty. These things need to work together. So I'm going um, to end there. We have recommendations in our report, but I'm just going to lay out the evidence for now, and then we can talk about what conclusions we draw from that later. <laughs>